1803, on the sands of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, man took his first step towards the sky. But he had not yet learned how to fly. That would come two years later. History would be made, and the first practical airplane would be built and flown in a cow pasture in Dayton, Ohio. Here, the Wright brothers would battle the odds in the world's first space race. Peace by peace, they would build the first practical airplane. Day by day, they would teach themselves how to fly. They would find the culmination of their life's work right here, in the same place it began, Dayton, Ohio. It's not just a Midwest city. By the late 19th century, it's the invention capital of America. In fact, as the 20th century begins, Dayton is ranked first in the entire country in patents per capita. Hundreds of well-known inventions would be dreamed up here including the cash register. It's a great place to be inspired, a great place to learn. It certainly was for two young brothers growing up in a suburban middle-class home. The youngest son is a minister. In the fall of 1878, Bishop Milton Wright brought home a little helicopter. You wind this up, and you let it go, and it flies! It was just a tiny toy, but it made a huge impression on his sons, Wilbur Orville. We're going to start with our multiplication tables today. Five times four. Five times four. In school, Miss Ida Palmer spotted her pupil, Orville, hunched over his desk, fiddling with two pieces of wood. Orville, what are you doing? Machine. A machine for what? To fly us up in the air. To fly us up in the air. Orville, pay attention please. Yes, ma'am. As they got older, Wilbur and Orville started to build. First, printing presses. Then, bicycles. Bicycles were the big fat of the 1890s, and soon the brothers had best sellers on their hands. The Sinclair to the Van Cleef. Neither of them had attended college. Neither had any formal engineering training. But as inventors, as practical problem solvers, that was their genius. It was Wilbur's idea to build a plane. In May of 1899, he wrote to the Smithsonian. I have been interested in the problem of mechanical and human fly ever since I was a boy. My observations since have only convinced me more firmly that human fly is possible and practical. I'm about to begin a systematic study of the subject. Their experiments would begin at Kitty Hawk on the North Carolina coast. They needed somewhere secluded, somewhere that has strong wind. They set up some cots and a gas stove in a light tent on the sand and set to work. It was a fall on the cusp of a new century, October 1900, and all around the world, the race for flight was beginning. French Captain Ferdinand Ferber was constructing gliders. Brazilian Alberto Santos Dumont was piloting airships. And Samuel Langley, head of the Smithsonian, had been given a small fortune, $50,000 by the U.S. Army to build a plane. As for Wilbur and Orville, they were just two young men from Dayton, Ohio, taking on the biggest engineering minds in the world. They spent days studying birds, wings, gusts of wind, jotting notes and sketches of everything they saw. And then they set out to build a flying machine. They called them gliders, two wings of fabric and wood. The brothers began 
with a series of unmanned flights. A couple of feet in the air, the glider dangled at the end of the road. Then, they climbed on board to test their glider. When the Wright brothers left Kitty Hawk at the end of 1901, they had in fact broken all the existing records for gliding. But on the train ride home to Ohio, they were discouraged. When we looked at the time and the money which we'd expended, and considered the progress made and the distance yet to go, we considered our experiments a failure. I made the prediction that man would sometime fly, but that it would not be within our lifetime. Back home in Dayton, Wilbur and Orville decided to continue their experiments. What they really needed was a way to perfect their wings. The use of the wind tunnel was the answer. It looked like a wooden box, a packing crate six feet long. But hidden inside was the delicate balance, the instrument that would allow them to discover the secrets of the wind. Catch it one more time and take a look. I the numbers answer. don't work, Orville. Look, the numbers don't work. I know that. That should not but it work. wasn't just the wind tunnel that made the difference. It was the way Wilbur and Orville worked. They were methodical. They were meticulous. Over a period of two months, they would test nearly 200 wind designs, comparing slight differences in sizes and shapes. With no formal training, they would work through engineering problems in the most detailed way, tracking the subtlest changes. Wilbur and Orville measured the lift of the wind and discovered that the calculations everyone else had been using were wrong by more than 20%. The two brothers pushed each other, they prodded each other, working together, working from scratch, and when they were finished, they had more practical information on wing design than anyone had ever developed. Along with this new information, they returned to Kitty Hawk in 1902, and over the coming weeks, their gliders would soar farther and farther. Our new machine is a very great improvement over anything anyone has built. We now believe that the flying problem is really nearing its solution. But Wilbur and Orl still had problems to solve. The two missing pieces to achieve powered flight were propellers and an engine, issues that had baffled everyone else for decades. With a magnitude leap, the Wright brothers were able to transform cutting-edge theoretical physics into practical mechanics and build these crucial elements from scratch. When they returned Kitty Hawk in 1903, they knew they were on the threshold of something big. Thursday, December 17th, 1903, a wind came out of the north, bringing with it great 20 mile an hour gusts. Standing together in their sharp suits on the dunes, the brothers clasped hands. It seemed to the spectator as if they weren't sure they see each other again. Orville climbed aboard, stretched out on the lower wing, and set off down the track. It was a magical moment. For the first time ever, a man-made, power-driven, heavier-than-air machine lifted off the ground on its own power and flew. The promise of that moment was infinite. But the reality was more limited. The longest flight made that day 852 feet in 59 seconds was just a short hop into the sky. There were still many hurdles to be overcome. How to control the aircraft, how to make it turn, and of course, how to get it into the air for more than a few seconds at a time. It was a first step, but it wasn't a practical plane yet. By late 1903, the competition was heating all across America, all around the world, others were trying to build flying machines. 
Did they create theirs first? And as they pushed harder and harder, were they in fact putting themselves in danger? Over the flight loomed the specter of a catastrophe, the risk of a deadly crash. Amateur pilots were learning it's not easy to build an aeroplane. Ever since Icarus, man had been trying to take to the sky and fail. These were the considerations as Wilbur and Orville confronted a key decision. After several seasons, we found ourselves at a fork in the road. On the one hand, we could continue playing with the problem of flying, so long as youth and leisure would permit. On the other hand, we believed that if we would take the risk of devoting our entire time and financial resources, we could conquer the difficulties. When the Wright brothers came to that fork in the road, they took the path home. The path back to Dayton. The job ahead of them was hard. They had to take the 1903 fire and turn it into a practical airplane. A plane that could do more than little hops. A plane that could stay in the air and turn and be controlled. Where do we test our experiments? First, they had to find a place to work. They chose Hoffman Prairie, an isolated field near a distant trolley shop. The owner, Torrance Hoffman, head of a local bank, didn't mind if they used it. Should suit your purposes very nicely. Yes, it does, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. And appreciate your job. Hoffman couldn't believe what they were doing. The Wright brothers are fools, he told his friends. And he seemed to be right, because from the start, there were problems. That summer of 1904 brought one frustration after another. They couldn't even match the flight time they had achieved on December 17th at Kehoe. Again and again, their flights ended in practice. The notebooks missed the damage, broken wings, wooden shrubs, Shattered like taffy, mangled propellers and smashed rudders, said Mother Beard, managing editor of the Dayton Journal. I sort of felt sorry for them. They seemed like well-meaning, decent young men. Yet there they were, neglecting their business to waste their time day after day on that ridiculous flying machine. The crashes weren't even worse. The most painful thing was not getting to the air at all. It would lay down the track in sections, totaling over 200 feet. Line the sections up precisely. Stake them at the ground. Get it all ready to go. And the wind would shift. And then have to start all over again. We have found great difficulty in getting sufficient initial velocity to get real starts. It is evident we'll have to build a starting device that will render us independent of the wind. That device went straight back to the Middle Ages. It was a catapult. They unveiled it on September 7, 1904. A 20-foot tower at the end of the track with a 1,600-pound weight at the top. When the pilot released the line, the weight would plummet to the ground, and the plane would be slipped shot into the air. It wasn't so different from the system used today on aircraft carriers, and it made all the difference. Now the brothers could count on safe takeoffs, even in the lightest of wind. Within a week, Wilbur and Orville were averaging a flight a day, and each day brought breakthroughs of distance and maneuverability. The hardest thing was executing a simple turn without stalling or crashing, and even that now seemed possible. People began to hear that something was going on over at Hoffman Prairie. 
On September 20th, a crowd gathered and witnessed a remarkable sight. A complete circle. A flight of over a minute and a half, almost a mile. The first circular flight ever. Beekeeper Amos Root had heard rumors about the Wright brothers and had driven 175 miles to see what was going on in that Ohio prairie. He couldn't believe what he witnessed. When it started that circle and came to the starting point, I was right in front of it. It was the grandest sight of my life. Incredible. Wilbur and Orville had their breakthrough. Now they dreamed of selling their plane. Early in 1905, the Wright brothers had a formal inquiry sent to the U.S. Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, telling him about their new invention. It was met with a form letter rejection. 